Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation. Let's learn more about protecting your mental health during cancer and beyond. Thank you for making your health a priority by spending this hour with us. I'm your host, Joan Heimbrook, Accreditation and Community Outreach Coordinator for Franciscan Health Cancer Center in Indianapolis and Mooresville. I'm excited for our team to share some great information with you in this installment of our Let's Learn More About Cancer webinar series. Prioritizing your mental health during and beyond cancer treatment is vital to well being. And this evening, with the help of our experts, we will help you better understand the results of stress on your body, mind, and spirit, effective coping skills for stress reduction that you can practice right away, how to incorporate mindfulness, art therapy, and other creative techniques to reduce your overall stress during cancer treatment and beyond. Now, before we get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. For this virtual event, participants are muted. We ask that you remain muted to help us avoid background noise and interruptions. If you have questions to ask our presenters, please type them in the chat window. We'll be answering your questions at the end of the webinar during our Q&A time. Our awesome administrator, Kirsten, is taking care of everything on the back end this evening. So if you experience any technical issues, just type them in the chat window and we'll work to resolve them as quickly as possible. If you miss anything, no need to worry. We'll send the recording of tonight's presentation to you in a follow-up email. And finally, make sure you have some paper and something to write with for an activity later in the presentation. Now, let's get things started with a quick poll question to see why you decided to join us this evening. Poll question number one, what sparked your interest in attending this webinar? A, I'm currently fighting cancer and want to learn more strategies for curbing stress and anxiety that come with a cancer diagnosis. B, I'm a cancer survivor and looking for ways to protect and maintain my mental health. And C, I'm a caregiver of a cancer patient or survivor and I'm looking for techniques to reduce stress and anxiety. Go ahead and put your, question, or your answers in. All right, it looks like uh, a lot of people are here for different reasons. Many of you are currently fighting cancer and you wanna learn some strategies. So you'll have a lot of great information tonight. Um, so we're, we're ready to help you with your cancer journey with uh, helping, your, helping you have a healthy mind, body and spirit. Franciscan Health is home to some of the country's most well-respected physicians and clinical specialists. I'm excited to introduce to you two amazing and gifted mental health professionals who will be leading tonight's session. Kayla Eplin is a licensed clinical social worker with a master's from the IU School of Social Work. Kayla works for Cancer Support Community and serves as their clinical hospital coordinator at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis. Kayla fell in love with Cancer Support Community's mission when she was placed at CSC for her clinical internship where she received oncology focused training in mental health. And that's where her love of working with cancer patients and survivors was born. Kayla also leads our Moving Beyond Cancer Survivorship Program, which you'll hear more about later. Megan Wiggins is a licensed mental health professional and art therapist who has been working with survivors and their families since 2017. Like Kayla, Megan also works with our partner organization, Cancer Support Community, and serves Franciscan health cancer patients at our Indianapolis campus. Megan holds a master's degree from Heron School of Art and Design and is a certified patient navigator. Megan uses her training to help others through talk and art to better understand themselves while working on their mental health. So now, without further ado, let's hand things over to our experts, Kayla Eplin and Megan Wiggins. Thank you so much, Joan, for that lovely introduction. You're fabulous. I wanna welcome you all again, just echo what Joan was saying uh, to this presentation tonight. Uh, we're first going to start getting a little bit reacquainted with our bodies first and foremost. So if you're at home um, and this sounds familiar, I'm very, very excited to hear that. But try to think if you've ever heard of the mind-body connection. This is something that whether you've had your doctor or another professional mention to you, or maybe you've seen it somewhere on TV or read it in an article. Um, but this is the concept that our physiological health and our um, physical health are tied directly together with our emotional well-being. So if you've ever heard the phrase, oh my gosh, 
you're going to worry yourself sick. There's a lot of truth and evidence behind that. Or if you notice, if you get really, really stressed out at home or at work, and you find that you are developing, you know, more sinus infections or a cold. Um, again, that's more so where that thought is coming from, this mind-body connection, that our emotions and our thoughts influence how we behave or more or on the inverse, don't behave. Um, so for example, if you think of something, you know, that you really feel strongly about, that you're really, really good at, you feel empowered, you feel confident in that space, you're going to keep doing that great thing. So for example, if you feel that you're, you know, the best chef, you know, your, your family loves your spaghetti and meatballs or your baked ziti or your lasagna, and you feel really proud and confident in every meal you make, you're going to produce a magical concoction every time, and you're going to feel confident in what you make. But unfortunately, the opposite is true too. So when we have negative thoughts and hold those and say negative things to ourselves, it also impacts. So if we, you know, say, you know what, I'm not a great person. I don't feel like I, I do enough around the house, right? I'm a great support system to my friends and family. We can see that same exchange happen as well. But um, there, there is a silver lining here. It's not all hopeless that because there is this exchange between you know, our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, we can make some little changes in order to improve how we think and feel, and both physically and emotionally. Um, so you can think of how you know, on your cancer journey that you know, if you start treatment and physically start feeling worse, emotionally, you will also feel worse. Or when you have those off weeks and you have a time to breathe because you're not you know, taking your treatment or um, whether you're doing a chemo treatment or radiation treatment, um, when you have that downtime and your body feels physically better mentally and emotionally, you notice, again, that mind-body connection that you're those things will follow suit as well. And another really easy peasy example that we'll touch more on later is exercise, if that helps connect some dots. So that's a little bit of our introduction to our body, our mind-body connection. Um, and I think we're gonna move right along to why we have so much stress. Yeah, so I will take it from here. Thanks, Megan, for getting us started. Good evening, everyone. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about stress and why we have so much of it. So a lot of times um, in my work, specifically with patients and survivors, people come to me asking, why am I feeling so stressed out? Why am I so anxious? Why am I feeling so depressed? Why has cancer brought on all of these new feelings for me? Um, some people come to me feeling like they should be past the hard part of cancer if they are beyond treatment. What I first and foremost want you to know is that no matter where you are at in your cancer journey, it is perfectly okay. And it is actually common for you to have these exacerbated feelings of stress. You might feel lost, you might feel stuck, you might feel scared, or even unsure how to navigate what comes next. So even after completing treatment, there is still more healing that needs to be done especially when it comes to our psychological and emotional health, given all that your body has been through. Another important thing to know here is that we all experience stress. It is simply a part, not a very fun part, but it is a part of being human. So we're all wired to experience stress because it helps us to survive. And I know that sounds very backwards, but stick with me for a moment. So just think, if we did not experience stress, how would we know if anything was wrong? How would we know if anything needs to be changed? Stress, when it is managed well, that's the key there, when it is managed, can actually be a healthy and helpful reaction that tells us, hey, you need to pay attention to this. When our bodies give us cues that we are experiencing stress, we go into an automatic stress response that we usually call fight, flight, or freeze. So some of us tend to be more of a fight person when we have stress. This means that we face the problem head on, um, we wanna tackle it, we fight through it um, so that we can survive. Some other people might experience a flight reaction to stress. 
So this means that you want to hightail it out of there, get away from that stressor as quickly as you possibly can. Finally, you have that freeze response where you just kind of pause and become immobile or paralyzed in times of high stress. All of these automatic reactions are designed to help you survive stress. It worked really well for us back when we were cave dwellers um, and we were constantly faced by high threat or dangerous situations. Now, the good news is we are no longer needing to fight off mammoths or tigers um, or any big beasts. However, we do have metaphorical beasts that chase us. So when you are in a high stress situation for a long period of time, your stress response can get stuck in that on position. So your light switch just flips on. And that makes it difficult for us to get calmed down even when that stressor is no longer present. So let's get back to that initial question of why do we have so much stress? Well, if you are here as a cancer survivor or as a caregiver to a survivor, it's likely that your experience with cancer has probably increased your level of anxiety, uncertainty, fear, depression, even anger. So cancer also tends to exacerbate the life stressors that already existed before diagnosis. Um, on top of the day-to-day the -day stressors that you encounter, you may also be navigating these uncomfortable emotions, which might be leading to your own stress response and your body telling you, hey, I need you to do something about this. So now let's talk about the role of stress in survivorship. You might be thinking, okay, well, you just said that stress is natural and everyone experiences it. So surely it must not be that bad for me, right? Well, unfortunately that's not true. Um, that was a trick question. So believe it or not, stress plays a huge, huge role in every area of our well-being. This is because of the mind-body connection that Megan discussed earlier. So a hot topic in the cancer world is this link between stress and cancer. The research is actually unclear as to whether stress is linked to cancer, but what we do know is that regardless of whether stress causes cancer, we know it's not good for our health. We know that stress can lead to everything on this list here. So a weakened immune system, um, sleep, sleep problems, difficulties concentrating, heart issues, cardiovascular problems, irritability, being more emotionally reactive. Um, it can have an impact on your resilience. It can impact other chronic diseases. And most recently, research has emerged that indicates those with cancer um, are 26 times 26% more likely to experience thoughts of taking their life as opposed to the general population. So this makes it that much more important to prioritize your mental health and well-being during and beyond a cancer diagnosis. Okay, ladies, thanks so much. So we've had some great information so far, but before we move on, let's test your knowledge with another poll question. This one's true and false. With practice, we can eliminate stress and the effects it has on our bodies. True or false? We'll give you a minute to answer the question. Okay, so actually uh, the answer is false. Stress can never be completely eliminated from our lives, but there are ways to manage it as Megan and uh, Kayla have mentioned. So let's listen in and learn more from Kayla and Megan about how. Thank you, Joan. So that's actually a really nice segue into our next point, as you can see. So kind of like what Kayla was mentioning earlier, you know, if stress is a natural thing and it's going to happen to me, that means I can't do anything about it, right? Well, not necessarily. 
uh, this would be a pretty short presentation if the answer was one of those. Um, but it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, you'll notice throughout this presentation, we'll use terms like stress reduction, stress management, and not destruction and elimination. Um, just like that poll question mentioned, noted that we can't actually eliminate all stress. I, I feel like I speak for, I'm gonna take a stretch and speak for everyone here and say, you know, life would be really different, maybe a bit more pleasant if we could eliminate all stress. Um, but unfortunately can't. So we have to learn tool, what are tools, behaviors, things that we can do to help control how we respond to the stresses we experience in our environment, whether that be in our relationships, at our workplaces, during cancer treatments, uh, episodes of anxiety, if you have those, um, rather than reacting from that place of stress. Uh, and that's where a lot of these tools will come in handy. Next slide, please. Sorry. So Megan, then I'm sure you guys are asking, what can I do about stress? Oh, fabulous question. You guys are doing great tonight. Well, first and foremost, it doesn't help to be stressed out about the fact that there is stress present. Unfortunately, that's kind of a big dose of lighter fluid on top of the fire. It's only going to add to the stress you're experiencing. And that's not something that's needed or helpful, unfortunately. However, like I mentioned a little bit ago, there are skills and tools and behaviors that you can practice and develop that will help you manage the stress that you're experiencing. And before we get into some of these tools, uh, some, some notes I wanna have for you is, first and foremost, stress management is a skill. You have to work on it and develop it. And there's gonna be trial and error that goes along with it. It's gonna take time to find something that fits for you or feels natural to help reduce your stress because not and everything we offer you is necessarily going to be a perfect peg fit. Again, this, things would be a lot easier if that was the case if things were more standardized, but sadly they're not. Um, so with that, you know, not just having patience, but also remembering not to be too frustrated at yourself. Again, um, it takes time to develop that skill to strengthen it. Think of your mind as a filing cabinet. If I give you a tool to utilize, if you don't practice it, your mind says, oh, great, thanks, and tosses it to the back of the cabinet. It takes time to practice using that skill so that file will move more and more up in the filing cabinet. So when you do experience a stressful event, your mind will say, oh, wait, I have this tool. This can help me. So again, with that, that's not something that changes overnight or is easy to implement. So try not to be too frustrated. Try to be patient and understanding with yourself. And last but not least, Kayla and I are gonna talk about the most scientifically evidence-based ways that we know as clinicians that will be helpful. This is not the end-all be-all for stress reduction and management tools. So if you have something that you know, you know of personally that we haven't mentioned, that doesn't mean it isn't helpful. It just means that's not something we might not get to. Also, with consideration, we only have you for so long tonight. This would be a very long presentation if we tried to cover absolutely every single stress reduction technique out there. So, you know, with that, you know, be open-minded, be open-hearted, and get a little creative. Put your own spin on things. Okay. So let's switch gears now and discuss some of the practices that we can use to tackle that stress. So here is one of my favorite ways to practice stress reduction called mindfulness. I'm going to pause just for a moment here so that you can take a look at this picture and really think about and notice what you see here. Okay, so before, oh, I'm sorry, back to the mindfulness slide. Before we talk about this picture, you're probably wondering what mindfulness is. So mindfulness is the state of active attention to the present moment, be right here, right now. Mindfulness has two key components. So the first is awareness. This is awareness of what's going on around you and within you. So your environment, but also your thoughts and feelings and how, how you're feeling inside your body. 
The second key component to mindfulness is acceptance. And this is the trickier part. This is the part that people tend to struggle more with in terms of mindfulness. So that means acceptance of whatever is happening without labeling it as good or bad, without putting a judgment on it, just letting it be what it is. So let's draw our attention back to this image here. You probably noticed that there is a person on a walk with their dog. Hopefully some of you got to take a nice walk with your dog today when the sun, sun was out shining. So the person has a lot of stuff all jumbled up in their head while they are physically there on that walk with their dog. They are not really in the present moment versus when you look at the dog, you might notice that their thoughts are all centered around what they see around them. So this dog is not worried about what just happened or what's getting ready to happen. He is simply noticing the trees, maybe feeling the warmth of the sunshine on his fur, maybe smelling the scent of another animal running by, maybe noticing the leaves blowing in the wind. So this dog is using his senses. He is truly there in the present moment. Many studies have shown that mindfulness helps to increase positive emotions while decreasing stress. So it helps with stress because when you're focused on the present moment, you really don't have a lot of room to be thinking about those worries, those fears, anxieties. Mindfulness helps you to remind your body that you are here right now in this moment and you are okay. So let's move on to our next stress reduction strategy, which is breathing. So one way to ground ourselves in mindfulness is by utilizing deep breathing. And that's the key word there, deep. So we need to make this sort of breathing deep and intentional. This is always a go-to for stress reduction because breathing helps to activate your parasympathetic nervous system. So that's, that's a big word I just gave you there. But basically what happens um, is if you think back to that mind-body connection. So this is a great example of that at work. Breathing triggers this part of your brain to secrete hormones that lower your blood pressure and your heart rate. So quite literally, when you are practicing deep breathing, it is relaxing your body. And we're going to practice square breathing this evening, with, which is just one of um, many different types of mindful breathing techniques. There is no right or wrong way to breathe. So if this one doesn't feel right for you, that's okay. Just listen to your body. And also, if you have any restrictions or limitations from your doctor, please keep those in mind. Your safety is first and foremost. So square breathing involves inhaling, exhaling, and holding your breath for counts of four. So you are going to follow along this square that you see here for four counts. You will breathe in for four counts. You'll hold for four counts. Breathe out for four counts and again, hold for four counts. So this exercise can be done as many times as you'd like, but I usually like to start out by suggesting that you try it out four times in a row. So in other words, you will follow along that cycle of that square for four times. It just helps to keep things easy, nice to remember with that number four. So we'll go ahead and practice now. If you would prefer to close your eyes and listen to my voice, I'm going to lead us through this exercise. Otherwise, you can keep your eyes open and follow along the square on your own. So first, go ahead and make sure that you are in a comfortable position. You want to be um, sitting up nice and tall if you're seated. That way you can get those big deep breaths in from your belly. Now blow out whatever remaining breath you have, and we will get started. Breathe in two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, Breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, 
four, and hold. Two, three, four. Breathe in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Breathe out. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Okay, so go ahead and return to your normal breathing now. Take a minute to notice how your body is feeling. Hopefully you feel a little bit more calm and relaxed and in this present moment. I'm gonna pass it over to Megan to talk about journaling. Thank you, ma'am. Hard to get back in the groove after that. I'm feeling really relaxed. I don't know about you guys. Um, so before we actually talk about journaling, we need to do some emotions 101. Surprise, I don't, I don't think you guys are prepared for more um, information in that regard, but I still feel like it's helpful to better understand how journaling can help. So if you are a person like myself and experience emotions, um, if you have a tendency to hold on to those emotions or to keep them tucked down inside, Newsflash, that's not good for us. We as humans are not made to hold on to any strong emotion for too, too long. Um, thinking back to that mind-body connection, there are severe consequences to holding on to, um, hold on to emotion for longer than intended. So if you ever think about, you know, a really, really stressful day, let's say you wake up late because you slept through your alarm and then you're running late for work. And then because of that, you don't get to eat lunch and then you accidentally are you know running into traffic because you're trying to get home to pick up the kiddos and through your just some bobble day you get home and your partner says, Hey honey, what's for dinner? That small event, because it's probably not about the dishes, can cause a huge blow up, or excuse me, and not about dinner. It can cause a huge blow up. Think of it as a Mentos moment, if you will. And what happens when we add, you know, a lot of Mentos, when we add a Mentos to a high pressure human right? A, a Coke bottle that's been shaken up a couple of times and we add that Mentos in, what happens? Lots of explosions. So we got sticky Coke everywhere. It's all over our hands, maybe all over our clothes. And that doesn't feel good. And it doesn't make the, our loved ones feel good. So I'm sure you're, you're asking at this point, Megan, well, what am I meant to do? If I holding in emotions is bad for me, what's another alternative? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. You're asking great questions. Um, just because it's it's not good for us to hold in our emotions doesn't mean talking about them is necessarily easy either. This is where journaling can come in handy. It offers you a safe, secluded, isolated space that's hopefully secure just to let those feelings out and allow that journal to hold on to those feelings so they can exist outside of you instead of holding them in. So we don't have to run into huge Mentos moments down along the line. Now, you don't have to be like me and fall in love with the really expensive journals you see at Hobby Lobby or Michaels or, you know, even um, in, in Barnes and Noble. You know, you don't need a super duper fancy journal or diary. A few scraps of paper are more than sufficient. Um, and there are lots of journaling prompts you can look up online uh, for free or um, thinking of simply what has happened that day. And with that, the format isn't important either. If the thought of writing paragraphs really prevents you from in, in, um, engaging with journaling as a stress reduction, I encourage you to make it a little bit smaller. Sometimes it's helpful to just write a bullet list of how you're feeling in that moment, and then maybe going back and writing a bit about what happened there. What brought up that big feeling that came up earlier, whether it's frustration or sadness or disappointment. Um, and, or if that format doesn't work, you can, you're more than welcome to journal just simply if, with what comes to mind. The key here is to be flexible and understanding and patient. So that's a little bit about journaling. Uh, but moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about gratitude as stress reduction. So think about if you've ever, you know, talked about a struggle you were having and someone said, well, you should just be happy. Try to look on the bright side. It's not that big a deal. That's not very helpful, is it? It's really, really dismissive towards how you're feeling about that big event that happened in the moment. 
Well, I have some good news for you. Gratitude is a little bit different. Gratitude doesn't negate how we're feeling. It doesn't ignore the negative feelings that we're having, but instead encourages us to find the positivity that lies alongside the negative. Like we've mentioned this whole time, you know, stresses are there. They're a natural part of our lives. And because of that, it can kind of eclipse or make it a little bit difficult to really see or engage in the positive that's there. Cancer and specifically treatment can also bog you down sometimes and make it hard to embrace the positivities that are there in life. Taking a step back and taking a moment to think about what are the things you appreciate? Who are the people you value? To make it a little bit easier to build up that reservoir of positivity. So again, we're not negating the negative. We're not saying the negative doesn't exist, but what lies alongside it in order to help build ourselves up? And the nice thing is you can combine this with our last stress reduction we just talked about with journaling. So a really easy PC stress reduction that I've given clients that I see individually is creating a gratitude journal. So whether you go to bed and think about what are just three things you appreciated about the day. Did you get to have something really yummy for lunch? Did you have a really great phone call with a loved one or a family member? Or did you hear your favorite song on the radio today? They don't have to be big things, just things you appreciated and made your load a little bit lighter that day. Or on the inverse, before you get up, maybe writing down three things that energize you or that you're excited to do today. Are you taking a trip? Are you going to go have a really nice lunch with a coworker or a family member? Is there a really awesome stress reduction 101 presentation you're going to this evening? What are things that uplift you, help you feel excited or help you realize what you appreciate? And again, we're not here to silver lining or detract that things are hard or difficult. We're trying to embrace both and recognize that they can coexist together. Right. So another fantastic way to manage our stress is by going to therapy. Surprise, the therapist and the art therapist are going to talk about therapy. <laughs> we love it. So let's hear a little bit more about what that means. So therapy has come a long way in recent years, and it's really not what it used to be even just a couple of decades ago. So licensed mental health therapists are trained in different techniques to help guide you to be the very best you that you can be. And if you've never been to therapy before, it's understandable and normal to feel intimidated by what that process could look like. Um, so therapy is a safe place that is just yours. You can use this space to talk about your thoughts, your feelings, all with a person who is completely unbiased and has no prior investments in your life. Um, therapists are able to be an active listener. They can validate your emotions and how you're feeling. They can help you work through, sort through, and process your experiences. Um, therapists offer, also offer you feedback. They can help to guide you in learning new stress reduction techniques. Um, they can help you to find coping styles that will work best for you. So a therapist is a great um, outsider who can take a step in and say, hey, I see that you're doing this really well. Um, or maybe this is something that you seem to be struggling with. What can we address here to help make this better for you? And there's many different types of therapy out there. So you have to find what fits you. I like to joke that finding a good therapist is like finding a good pair of jeans. Um, it does take some trying on and looking around before you might find the best fit for you. Or maybe you try on that first pair and it, it works right away and it's an amazing fit, but that's not always how it goes. So we just encourage you, um, if you've tried therapy before and it didn't seem like a great fit for you, maybe give it a try with someone new. Um, one thing to note here is that Cancer Support Community offers free individual counseling to couples, families, and we also, and individuals, um, and we also have art therapy services. So stay tuned for our contact information um, at the end of this presentation to learn more about how you can get signed up. 
Fabulous. Thank you. So another surprise, the art therapist is going to talk a little bit about art therapy. Um, so I like to take just a few minutes just to dissect the word art therapy because I'm sure if you've not seen it on TV or on the news or on a coloring book, some people can have trouble with that word. It can sound a little vague. So I have for you here the official definition from the American Art Therapy Association. So very, very official. But it also, it's a little bit vague. So I like to take this step by step. I've actually highlighted some parts that I feel are very important to understand what art therapy is and how it works. So let's kind of translate this into English, if you will. First and foremost, art therapy is a mental health in human services profession. So you're going to be working alongside a trained professional in the mental health field, whether that's individually in a family setting or other populations, and most importantly, in the oncology cancer population. Uh, but we're really focused on using the process of making art. So we're not necessarily looking to create the next Vincent Van Gogh Starry Night. We're not going to make the next Water Lilies or the next Mona Lisa. We're here to use the art as a tool to better understand how we're doing throughout the struggles or challenges we're facing in our lives, whether that be in our relationships, in our treatments, or other struggles that might be coming up. And I always like to highlight this, but it's not just coloring books. So please don't grab your torches and picks for just yet. Coloring books are very valuable. They're a great meditative exercise. They're great for reducing stress, but they're not exactly art therapy. That's because when you are doing art therapy, you're working alongside another professional who's trained to see warning signs or maybe look at your art in a different way with you. So you're, there's a bit of a discussion element there. And I have some studies. Uh, I, there are definitely studies out there that talk a little bit about our stress hormone cortisol does go down when we just make art and that's without the art therapy piece. But with that, in engaging in art therapy, we can see improvement into understanding who we are, understanding how we deal with things, improvement in our mood and our self-esteem as well. Um, the easiest way to deal with stress, aside from coloring, scribbling. Um, and like Kayla alluded to earlier, CSC, Cancer Support Community, does offer free art therapy sessions as well as groups, um, an open art studio as well that I facilitate on the, uh, both as a hybrid group. So if you'd like to join in person at Franciscan Health on the South Side, you're more than welcome to come, meet the first and fourth Wednesday of the month. Um, and you're also welcome to join that hybrid as well. Um, another way art therapy is utilized at Franciscan Health is Art Cart on Infusion Site. So while you're actively receiving your chemo treatments, um, myself or one of my clinical art therapy interns will be more than happy to come by and make a card with you, do some coloring, or just talk about how are things going. Again, with the intention of helping you relax, decompress. We're not here to judge or grade or talk about our skill level. That is not the important part here. So at this point, I feel like I've definitely convinced everyone who's on here to give art therapy a try, right? We're definitely feeling up to it, huh? Well, now's the time I want you to go ahead and grab a pencil and your sheet of paper if you have it. Um, and we're gonna do a really quick activity together just to get an idea of what this art therapy business is all about. So before you actually draw anything, I'd like you to, if you'd like to close your eyes or look down or away, feel free. But I want you to think about these past couple of years. We've had a lot of changes come our way with COVID, with adjustments to have to make, whether that's personally, maybe professionally, and that's not to shirk away from changes in your treatment or your experiences as a cancer survivor or active, <laughs> active uh, cancer patient or as a caregiver. But spend some time thinking of what are the changes you've had to go through? What were those experiences like and how did they feel? Did you feel frustrated? Did you feel angry? Were you sad, disappointed? Did you feel isolated or alone? 
once you've got a great picture of how that felt, I want you to grab your pencil and just scribble. Just allow your hand to scribble all over the page. And once you've gotten to a comfy point where you're like, you know what, Megan, I'm all scribbled out. I've been scribbling this whole time, I'm good. I want you to look at your scribble, this big thing that's a big, maybe looks like a gobbledygook or maybe lots of bubbles, who knows? Whatever it looks like, I wanna challenge you to try to make something out of that scribble. When you look at these lines that are all kind of working together, what can you make out? Can you make anything? Is it hard to see anything to make? And while you're doing that, my intention here is the past couple of years have not been easy. I'm sure that's fair to say. <laughs> if anything, probably an understatement with a lot of change and struggles and difficulties. And that can be frustrating when we have a plan for things and things change. It can be hard to see those positives or see what's possible in the mess. And that's kind of where I wanna align you here, that looking in this, in this scribble, this convoluted <laughs> connection of lines, where's the potential that lies there? Sometimes doing something like this can help your brain picture that struggle a little bit differently. So the next time you're feeling overwhelmed or frustrated or overloaded, or whatever feeling that sits there, give scribbling a try. Okay, thank you ladies for sharing so many great techniques with us so far. We're learning a lot this evening. And uh, everyone remember to type your questions for Kayla and Megan in the chat box so they can get to as many as possible during our Q&A session, which is gonna start here shortly. Let's answer one more audience poll question this evening. Which of the following are ways to reduce stress and anxiety? A, therapy, including art therapy. B, physical exercise. C, yoga and meditation. D, nutrition. Or E, all of the above. We'll give you a minute to answer. Okay, you, you guys are so smart. You've been listening. <laughs> all right, the answer is indeed E, all of the above. As our experts take us through some final techniques to manage stress, I wanna remind you, type those questions in the chat box so we can get your questions answered in just a few minutes. Take it away. All right, so as you know, exercise can be a great, great stress reduction tool. And you might be sick of hearing us talk about the mind-body connection, but exercise is another very fitting example of how our minds and our bodies are very closely intertwined. So exercise increases our physical health, um, but it also releases that feel-good chemical in our brain, and it can improve our mental health as well. So exercise serves as a great way to release some stress, um, increase your resiliency, and exercise helps to reduce our risk of several chronic, chronic illnesses, and it even reduces the risk of cancer recurrence. And again, as backwards as it may sound, exercise can actually help to combat that fatigue that you may feel after treatment. The great news is that exercise can be done in so many different ways. All physical activity counts as exercise, and you do not have to go to the gym and sweat your buns off to get some good physical movement. Um, exercise can look like anything from cleaning to walking the dog, playing with your grandkids, dancing in your kitchen. Any movement that brings you joy can be considered exercise. Here at Cancer Support Community, we offer several wellness classes and exercise programs. And so that includes personal training sessions, gentle stretch yoga, we have chair exercise, and even walking club. All of these programs are free of charge, um, and our Moving Beyond program also incorporates gentle exercise, which we will talk more about um, here in a minute. 
So you heard me mention just a moment ago that CSC offers gentle stretch yoga, and this is one of our most popular programs here at Franciscan Health. Um, we have a class that meets Monday evenings at 4.30, and it's a virtual class, so anyone can join us no matter where they're located. Um, but it is super popular here because of the benefits that yoga brings. So yoga is one of the oldest forms of exercise. It's been practiced for over 5,000 years around the world. Um, it is an excellent workout as it burns calories. It'll help to tone and strengthen your muscles. Um, it increases balance and flexibility. But along with that, it is also another great stress reduction strategy um, as it's very rooted in mindfulness and in the breath. It allows your body to just relax and recharge. And I, I know that yoga might seem intimidating if you've never tried it before, um, but there are many forms of yoga. They do not all involve standing on your head or doing the splits. Um, so here at CSC, we do offer gentle stretch yoga, which is very beginner friendly, and it can be done just from sitting in a chair. We have um, a lot of different class offerings throughout the week, but like I mentioned, um, our specific Franciscan class is on Monday evenings at 4.30. Thanks, Kayla. So our next redu stress reduction, excuse me, is nutrition. Surprise, surprise. Um, and I'm sure that's a surprise since, you know, we don't always think of our food when we think of stress reduction. But if you've ever heard the term, you know, you are what you eat, there's some truth to that, but don't panic. Um, there, there's a lot of flexibility here. When we eat foods that are nutrient dense or more nutritious, we can see an increase in our mood, our activity level, and as well as our physical health. And mind you, there aren't magic foods or superfoods that will magically make you feel better um, or make treatment any easier. It's important to be balanced when it comes to nutrition. So not overdoing it on the nutrient dense foods, but you know, having some flexibility to have both. Um, a great way to use nutrition um, in, in within the realm of stress reduction is mindful eating. So that is the process of just being with yourself and the food you're eating, not multitasking and not taking on any other responsibilities, just reflecting on how the food tastes, how it feels in your body and how you feel in that moment. Um, so mind you, that sounds easier said than done, I'm sure, but it's important not to expect things to be perfect or that you'll try this and it will go absolutely smoothly when you do try it. Um, and newsflash, no one eats healthy 100% of the time. I, I'll definitely raise my hand and attest to that. Uh, but it's always important to abide by the 80-20 rule as best as you can. So 80% of the time we're eating healthily and 20%, maybe we give ourselves some treats or aren't as strict. Um, balance is always key, of course, in nutrition, but in all things we do. If you do have any specific dietary concerns, however, we want to strongly encourage you to seek out a uh, consultation from your dietitian, either here at Franciscan um, or your uh, specific oncologist, radiologist, most primarily your medical team, that's most important. And Cancer Support Community does offer free cooking and nutrition classes. And nutrition is one of the, uh, I'd say one of the key components of moving be of the Moving Beyond program as well. So moving right along to our next stress reduction, we have social support. So socialization um, is one of those things where it, it fits a little bit differently for everybody. We don't necessarily need as much we, we might need more or less socialization, but it is a necessary part of being a human being. Um, and it's very important in going through your cancer journey to have a built up support system that can help you through when things are really difficult or it feels hard to see some of those positives. Um, and I feel like support groups do get a bad rap, unfortunately, from the media or things you might see on TV. Um, but support groups can be a very empowering place to connect with people who have this experience that while it might not be the same as what you're going through in treatment, 
have a better idea of what it's like to be a cancer survivor, to know what it's like to go to chemo and not feel great about having your port access, to feel exhausted after radiation treatment, to struggle after a surgery or a lumpectomy or what have you. Um, but that being said, it can still be an intimidating space, especially if you're not used to being there. Um, but you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can build up supports you already have, whether that's friends, family members, and the like. Uh, but with that, we want to be cognizant and mindful of the supports that we have. We want to be aware of how we feel before and after, you know, we have conversations. So we want to be, pay attention to people we can talk with and not feel judged or feel worse about ourselves. We want to walk away from those conversations saying, you know what, I'm a pretty great person. I shower, I recycle, I do nice things. I feel better about myself rather than people who maybe make us feel worse, make, me make, they make us think that we're not great people. Um, those are toxic and not helpful to our growth as humans. So maybe we wanna minimize our contact or our engagement with those types of relationships. But going back to support groups, Cancer Support Community does have, as you can see here, lots of different support groups at different hospital sites uh, for patients, caregivers, survivors, and some cancer specific groups. Um, of course, I don't have, <laughs> I, I won't be able to go through absolutely all of our support groups, but if you need more information, we're coming towards the end of our presentation, we'll be able to give you more info there. All right, so I know you've heard us mention Moving Beyond several times already. And if you're listening to this webinar tonight and thinking to yourself that, you would like to work on all of the areas of stress reduction that we've spoken about so far, um, the Moving Beyond program may be a, a good fit for you. So this is an eight-week program that was designed to help survivors and caregivers not just survive, but thrive with a healthy lifestyle after a cancer diagnosis. So every week in this group, we do exercise together, we discuss nutrition, and we practice stress reduction. We have different guest speakers that come in to address um, a whole bunch of different survivorship topics, everything from symptoms and side effects management, to spirituality, to intimacy concerns, and we even participate together in a little mini yoga session. So you can also experience social support through meeting and talking with other survivors and caregivers which as Megan just mentioned, can be an incredibly important part of this journey. These classes are offered virtually and in person at the Franciscan Cancer Center in Indianapolis. If you would like to register, you can call me or email me at the phone or email listed here at the bottom of the screen. And again, we'll have our contact information listed at the end of the presentation as well. All right, so moving along, turning back to our stress reduction strategies, Metascation is another great tool to use um, when life becomes overwhelming. Just like journaling, art therapy, therapy, and exercise, there are also many ways to practice meditation. You do not have to sit on a pillow and listen to a chant unless that is what speaks to you and that's what works for you. Meditation can be done through coloring, journaling, breathing, walking in nature, or even using a guided meditation that you may find online or on an app. There's even meditation apps that you can get on your watch nowadays. So meditation is all about using mindfulness. It allows you to train your body to have a greater awareness and bring your attention to the present moment. Meditation helps us to reduce stress, it reduces depression, anxiety, and it increases memory, attention, and empathy. It stimulates that part of the brain that creates positive emotion and allows us to feel more emotionally balanced. So if you're interested in giving meditation a try, a good starter point is guided meditation. And CSC does offer a free virtual guided meditation on Thursdays at 545. So our final strategy to address mental health and stress reduction is by utilizing self-compassion. 
many of us are our own worst enemy. That voice that we hear in our head is often the loudest and clearest voice that we ever hear. So we need to be really intentional about what that voice is saying. Remember that our thoughts influence how we feel. So a great way to challenge that voice when it is being unkind is to ask yourself this question. What should I say or what would I say to a loved one who came to me with this problem? How would I respond to them? One of my favorite researchers and social workers, Brene Brown, says, talk to yourself like you would talk to someone you love. And this can be a really great way to change our inner dialogue. Another way to work on self-compassion is through journaling, which Megan talked about earlier. So you can write out your thoughts and feelings. Take the time to thank yourself in that journal for something good you did. Maybe thank yourself for something kind or courageous that you conquered that day. Meditate on that feeling of self-compassion. So it's important to practice self-love and speak kindly to yourself. Remember that key word is practice. It is something that takes effort, intention, and a lot of work. Thank you, Kayla. So as we wind down from our presentation, I have a couple of take-home notes. I'm sure you can notice how there's a bit of a book in there. Like we've been reiterating uh, throughout this entire evening, practice, practice, practice. Practice makes permanent, not perfect. The more you practice something, the more of a habit it will be and more natural it will feel. Give things a try more than once. Just because something didn't stick the first time you did it doesn't mean all is lost. Give it a try or maybe to my next point, do it differently, get creative. Try to put your own spin on it, personalize it, make it even more natural for you and more specific to you. And like I mentioned earlier, these are not the only ways to reduce one's stress. Of course, again, this would be a very long presentation if we tried to tackle that. Um, but I don't doubt that you might have found something that worked for you personally that we didn't cover here. I don't doubt that for a moment. But that doesn't mean that isn't helpful just because we didn't talk about it. We're just talking about evidence-based uh, ways to reduce stress. If anything we've talked about today that you feel like would be a little bit different if you turned it slightly sideways, I wanna encourage you to do that as well. Again, the more you can personalize it, the more natural it will be for you to utilize and more likely you will be to do it. So last but not least, um, if you have an interest, if we picked your interest at this point, and you'd like to know more about Cancer Support Community or our partnership with Franciscan Health Indianapolis, I have a couple of different contact listed for here for you. So Hunter Stafford is our program manager at Cancer Support Community. Our, our main building is located on West 71st Street in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I have our main number there and her contact email there for you. I have Kayla Eplin's contact number and email with more specific information about programming we offer in partnership with Francis Franciscan Health. And last but not least, I have included myself. If you would like, again, more information on Franciscan Health, any, any information about our partnership, or more specifically, any information about any art-based or art therapy programming, or anything we talked about generally today, my contact information is listed there for you. Okay, ladies, thank you so much. This has been a really great evening, lots of great information. I did want to mention something too, because um, in answering a couple of questions during the presentation, we did have someone that asked about uh, cancer support community and different services in their area. Um, obviously, you guys don't have uh, in uh, services at every single hospital uh, in, or in and around the state. But I did want to mention that the Moving Beyond program is, there is a virtual program that we do, uh, and then also in person. So uh, Kayla leads that program, and we do know that we get people from all over. Up in Chicago, we've gotten them from uh, as far 
south as North Carolina. So if you cannot uh, get in touch with certain programs, Moving Beyond is a really great way to be able to do that and you can do that virtually. So I did wanna mention that. Um, we do hope that you've learned some new and helpful ways to manage stress and anxiety during your cancer journey and beyond this evening. And I wanna thank Kayla and Megan so much for sharing your valuable information. And we do have a couple of questions. Um, we don't wanna to run too far over because we wanna be mindful of your um, time. So um, I do wanna just bring up a couple of questions that we weren't able to answer earlier. Uh, one person wrote, I've struggled with loneliness since my cancer diagnosis, and I feel like my friends don't really know what to do or say to me. So they stay away and I really need their support. Uh, and being with my friends and family makes me feel more normal. How can I get them back in my life? I, I first want to validate you know, everything you're saying, you can't, I can't begin to imagine any of this is easy and especially have to add going, feeling like you have to go through this alone. Um, and not to take away from that. I feel like I hear this from a lot of patients that, and our loved ones trying to be mindful of the struggles we're going through with treatment. They can sometimes pull away a little too much. Um, and Kayla might have a different answer for me, but I would encourage you to have an open and honest conversation. You know, let them know, try to speak from how you're feeling first and foremost. You know, if you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling lonely, sad, and then talk about, uh, move to talk about ways, you know, you would like to have more support from them. So, you know, maybe saying like, hey, I've, fe I've been feeling really lonely. I feel really alone when I go through this treatment all by myself. It would really help me if, you know, we could have more regular dinners together or if we could spend some time, you know, doing something together or can we have more phone calls? So letting them know how you feel with something specific that you feel would help. Um, and it, it's, it sounds very simplistic, but it can do a world of difference. I feel like sometimes our loved ones are so caught up in protecting us they are not even aware of this type of a side effect. They don't necessarily think that, oh, maybe they want me to be nearby, you know? And that comes from, that's coming from a genuine place and probably a, a place of care. So we wanna respect that as best we can. Uh, but Kayla, if you have anything to add, of course. No, I think that was very well said. Um, and then I'll also just give a reminder that sometimes it's okay if you feel like your needs aren't being met from your close friends or close family. It's okay to look for outside sources of support. So maybe that's where getting plugged into a support group or a survivorship group, a place where you can talk with people who really do have a good understanding and a grasp of where you're at right now. Well, and I think ladies too, sometimes people, um, are afraid to talk about someone's illness because they're afraid that they don't want to talk about their illness. And it's not that they don't want to talk about their illness. They just want to talk. So I think that's really important. I think you guys have really um, hit on that tonight. So we appreciate that. Um, another question, it says, you've talked about stress, anxiety, and depression, but I struggle a lot with anger over my cancer. How can I move past that? Oh, that's a really good one. I'm, I'm glad you asked because that is a very, very common experience that we see um, with, with any sort of big emotions. A lot of times we can kind of almost mask that emotion or those big emotions with anger. So we, in the mental health field, we talk about this as the anger iceberg. So in other words, if you picture an iceberg um, above the water, all you see is this little bit of the iceberg. Below the water, there's this huge, big chunk. And sometimes that's how we express our emotions. So if we're feeling angry, that might be what's coming up. That, that might be the surface level emotion. But underneath that anger, we might be feeling a little bit more of those vulnerable emotions. So that's going to be um, the worry, the fear, the uncertainty, the hurt. Um, feeling out of control, feeling helpless, those more vulnerable emotions are difficult for us to express. So sometimes they just come out as anger and that's okay. It's also okay to just be angry because that's a very valid emotion to feel as well. 
you're allowed to feel like this is unfair. You're allowed to feel that this shouldn't have happened to you because you're right, it shouldn't have happened to us, to you. However, what we have to do from there is address the anger, work through it, and use some of those stress reduction tools to um, continue moving forward. Megan, do you have anything to add? I mean, I first will say that's fabulous. I, <laughs> the only thing I would honestly add is um, when I've worked with clients who do struggle with their anger, um, especially when it comes to like, I, I'm not the person I was, or I can't do the things that I used to do. And that makes me mad. I don't like this version of myself. I feel like we spend a lot of time allowing ourselves to be okay with being angry. Because I feel like as a society, you know, we're taught that anger is bad. We don't want to feel it. We don't want to be angry. But sometimes it's okay to allow ourselves that permission to say, you know what, this really stinks and I'm mad. And letting that out. So if you want to turn up your music in your car and sing really loud to it, if you want to grab a pool noodle and slam it on the ground, if you want to scream into a pillow, giving yourself that safe space to let that anger out. So it's not pulled up inside of you and consuming you is really, really healthy. And more importantly, kind of like uh, feeding into Kayla's point, when you give that anger that space to discharge, you know, that high energy, nine times out of 10, that other em emotion that's hiding underneath the anger that the anger is masking will have space to come through. So if you're feeling disappointed, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling hurt, you'll be able to engage with that a little bit easier once you've given that anger that space because it takes up a lot of space, realistically. If you allow it to, to exist, it becomes a bit, it comes, well, a lot easier to confront those other feelings that are there. All great points. Thank you, ladies. Um, another question, it says, uh, before my cancer, I had never had an anxiety attack, but I've had a couple of them um, since, uh, especially before a recent scan. And I know scanxiety is kind of a big thing. Uh, is there anything you can recommend to try and stop an attack before it comes on? Another really good question. And again, another common experience to start having some more of those panic type, type symptoms when you're going in for a scan or have a big important appointment coming up. Um, one of the techniques I really like to use with my patients is grounding. And so grounding helps to bring you back into the present moment, and it helps to remind your body that you are safe and you are okay right now. Um, so a really easy, quick way to practice grounding is by using your five senses. So that would be um, what you see, what you feel, what you hear, what you smell, and what you can taste. Um, so we call it five, four, three, two, one, or just simply five senses activity where you can use your senses to engage you in the present moment. So for example, I'm going to think of five things, or sorry, I'm going to notice five things that I can see right now. And I really take my time with that. I observe the details of what I'm seeing. So I'm not just saying I see the wall, I see the chair, but I'm saying I see the texture on my wall. I see that little dog hair that's stuck to my desk over there. Um, so really noticing the details. Then you can do four things that you can um, touch. So what can you feel? Three things that you can taste. That might be a trickier one. That might take a little bit more effort. Maybe two things that you can smell and something that you can hear. So use your senses to ground you into the present moment. And that's going to remind your body that I am safe right now. I'm okay. Um, you know, it might feel like my thoughts are racing and my heart's going to pound out of its chest, but realistically, I am right here. I'm still on this on this earth. My feet are planted on the ground. I am okay. Megan, do you have any other strategies you like to use for panic? One thing I like to do, especially when it comes to anxiety, um, I try to empower my clients to be as informed about their, not just their anxiety, but how it plays in themselves. So not just knowing what their triggers are, but what are their warning signs? Because 
if we know what our mental and our physical warning signs are, we can be more prepared for when the attack is going to happen. Unfortunately, I don't think um, there's any way to completely be rid of anxiety attacks, just like stress, anxiety is one of those natural things that you're going to experience. But what we can do is strategize how to prevent getting to the space where we are in an active attack and what we can do to cope with after to lull ourselves out. So if we notice that our heart rate goes up, if we get a little bit sweaty, if we notice that we're pacing, if we notice we get on a hamster wheel or a snowball, recognizing when that's happening and putting something in place to intervene so we don't actually have to get to the attack. So whether that's something we talked about today, the breathing, scribbling is really great for this. Um, but also, um, I guess another technique that works that isn't in this presentation, I like to call it the what happens next game. So something to get your brain off of that hamster wheel is to think of the next logical step that is coming. Because what tends to happen is our mind is very focused on all the possibilities. It helps to pull it back to focus on the next logical step that's going to happen. And in that, recognizing what the reality is helps us get away from the anxiety of the possible, if that makes sense. Great, thank you so much. I think we're gonna, I know we're running over a little bit, but we've got great questions and it looks like our participants are hanging on. So so we're thankful for that. Thank you so much for allowing us to go a little further. Um, and before we, I give you this last question, I do want to know, we had someone who sent a question through um, that I'd like to connect you with a dietitian. I did send a private message. So if you want to uh, send back an answer to that, uh, I'd like to get you hooked up with a dietitian for your issue. Um, just answer that and we'll get to you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, but our final question is someone, and this is a great one. We just talked about panic. Uh, and anxiety, this one actually leans towards guilt. It says, I feel a lot of guilt about my cancer because I feel like years of smoking contributed to it. So what can I do to work through that guilt? I first want to say, again, I can't begin to imagine how heavy that has to feel or that any of that's easy to navigate. And especially if it feels like you're doing it on your own. But something I like to remind clients of, um, because I've experienced this with clients, that you know, if I had have gone to the doctor sooner, if I had have changed up my diet, if I was more active, maybe I wouldn't have had this cancer. That guilt is not there to make you feel better. That's not how guilt works as a feeling, as an emotion. It's not there to help you feel better. So one thing I encourage clients to do is to be understanding and self-compassionate first and foremost. Cancer is not something that is controllable or predictable. There's no way you can control it, even if you feel like you have behaviors that have contributed. And I know that's not a picture perfect answer, but it is the reality. Spending time with yourself to, you know, Embrace that, embrace that, you know, I've done everything I can at this point to rectify what I could and I'm in a better place where I'm actively receiving treatment. I'm doing the changes I need to do. I feel is the more helpful route to go in this space. And Kayla will probably have a different answer for me, but that's just something I wanna highlight is first and foremost, recognizing that this guilt is not here to be helpful. Megan stole my answer. <laughs> no, that's that's exactly what I was um, going to reiterate is just that recognizing that guilt is not serving you. Um, so what can we put our energy into that will serve you? So maybe, you know, instead when you notice that guilt creeping up, um, naming it and taming it and saying, hey, no, I'm not going to let that guilt goblin win today. I like to <laughs> I like to give it a little finger wag. Um, and just kind of make light of it and say, no, go away, guilt. I'm not going to deal with you today. You're not helping me. You're not here to serve me. And then put into practice a helpful strategy that you can use or give yourself some self-love. Um, do a loving kindness meditation. Do something that, that brings you some warmth and comfort because that guilt is not serving you. 
Um, and I would also encourage you if you're open it to seek out therapy, maybe try some counseling to see if you can work through and process that with a professional. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies. I know that guilt, sometimes people don't always connect cancer and guilt, but there is a lot of guilt behind that. Just like you were saying, Megan, that so many times there are people look at lifestyle and different choices, but cancer does not discriminate. It is there for anyone and everyone for lots of different reasons. Um, so we want to be uh, cognizant of everyone's time. We know we've run over, but this has been a great presentation. And we want to thank Kayla and Megan so much for sharing so much great information with us this evening. So if we didn't get to your question tonight, we'll do our best to contact you by the phone number or email address that you provided during registration. And we'd like to thank you all for attending tonight's webinar, Protecting Your Mental Health During Cancer and Beyond. We understand that your time is valuable. So we thank you for prioritizing your health and in this case, your mental health to spend time with us this evening. Once again, we'll send you an email with the recording of this session. Uh, feel free to watch it again and share it with others who you think might uh, find it helpful. You'll also receive a brief survey at the end of this webinar with uh, about its content and what your feedback is really important to us. So please make sure that you take a few moments to fill out that survey. It helps us to make webinars in the future even better. On behalf of everyone at Franciscan Health, we wanna thank you for being with us and have a blessed evening.